thanks for dropping by to today's video where we're going to be talking about diabetic retinopathy. So it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, diabetic retinopathy is a retinopathy that develops specifically in diabetic patients. Now, um, diabetic retinopathy is particularly important uh, because diabetic retinopathy is the number one cause of blindness in the world. So uh, controlling and managing this is very, very important uh, when it comes to blindness and other morbidities. So let's talk about the uh, pathogenesis. So um, initially, um, diabetic retinopathy uh, starts to begin due to an increased blood flow. And this is due to the hyperglycemia that develops. So when you have hyperglycemia, for one reason or another, it tends to increase the blood flow to the retina. And the increase in, you know, obviously, if you have more blood, there's going to be more sheer stress on the blood vessels. So that tends to damage the blood vessels. Eventually they become very leaky. Um, and as they become leaky, the fuel fluid accumulates uh, around the uh, uh, macula and it, cause, it can eventually lead to macular edema um, or generalized uh, edema of the retina. Um, that's one one uh, one sort of pathogenesis. Another is going to be due to the, the production of intracellular sorbitol. Now, sorbitol develops when you have uh, it develops from glucose, so glucose converts to sorbitol, but it only converts to sorbitol when you have a, a very high amount of glucose within the cell. So much glucose that it, the, the cell does not, no longer know what to do with it, so it just starts shifting into sorbitol uh, just so we can start managing it. Now, this the enzyme that uh, catalyzes this reaction is called aldose reductase, definitely an important uh, enzyme to remember uh, for your boards. And what's interesting enough is the aldose reductase uh, enzyme uh, requires NADPH. So one of the initial problems that, that this develops is you have low NADPH. And as, as you probably remember, NADPH is required uh, for glutathione. And glutathione uh, is a reducing agent. So with low NADPH, you get an increased oxidative stress. It's kind of like G6PD, but in the uh, cell of the eye. Also, sorbitol is osmotically active. So since it's osmotically active, it absorbs water into the cell, leading to further edema um, rather than th just the uh, edema caused by the uh, leakage of the vessel. So this is going to be another cause of the edema that these patients experience. Um, the other is going to be the advanced glycated enzymes. Adva advanced glycated enzymes is uh, uh, basically when you have hyperglycemia, it starts to, it starts to glycate uh, specific amino acids on proteins. The glycation of these amino acids on proteins uh, eventually will lead to cross-linking of collagen. And when you cross the collagen, um, you're going to increase the vessel permeability, again, leading to more uh, fluid leakage and then again leading to edema. Also, um, this explains uh, a lot of the reasons why diabetic patients tend to get cataracts. Um, these uh, these cross-links in the collagen can also cross-link within cataracts and then lead to the eventual ca uh, cataract formation. Sorry, in the lens, which leads to cataract formation. Um, the other is going to be, there is a receptor, uh, which is receptor for advanced glycate, glycated enzymes. Um, when this receptor gets activated by the AGEs, um, this causes a pro-inflammatory pro state. And as you remember, um, with inflammation, you have increased vessel permeability and dilation and all these things. And so that's another reason why you tend to get this edema and, and uh, leakage of the fluid. Finally, um, neovascularization. And neovascularization is kind of, uh, the later stage of diabetic retinopathy. And what creates this neovascularization? Well, you get hypoxia. And this hypoxia can, again, be to some sort of microthrombi that develops or any of these types of fluid losses that you're getting over here. Um, and so when these thrombi develop, uh, this eventually is going to lead to hypoxia of certain tissues. And when these tissues become hypoxic, they begin to release uh, va uh, you know, vascular and cellular growth factor as well as other growth factors. And, if, and then you get new vessel formation. Now, of course, new vessel formation is no problem. However, the problem is uh, that these vessels are leaky. And so when these vessels are leaky, and especially when you have high blood flow going towards them, uh, they'll tend to, again, leak more easier. and They can't handle the stress because, again, it's like a newly formed vessel. So that is the general pathogenesis. Now what I'm going to do is we're going to talk about the pathophysiology. So what happens uh, what what effects do these high blood flows and this uh, edema has? So um, pathophysiology, one thing that you want to keep in mind, um, you may realize this or not, um, the retina uh, is very metabolically active, or maybe I should say uh, has high metabolic activity. Okay, so the activity of the, of the retina is 
very high. So even small drops in blood flow, you know, the retina will react uh, very, uh, have a large reaction to that. Okay, so the um, diabetic retinopathy has two stages. The early stage is known as the non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, um, also written as NPDR. And the non-proliferative means that it's uh, it's not creating new cells yet. Okay, so remember, neovascularization, which is the proliferative uh, diabetic retinopathy, is characterized by this uh, new vessel formation. And so again, this is the early stage of diabetic retinopathy. So what happens here? Well, of course, like we kind of already discussed, you have microvascular dysfunction, right? And so this microvascular dysfunction, um, for whatever, all, all the four reasons we mentioned earlier, this le leads to loss of pericytes and it damages the epithelium, sorry, endothelium. And so uh, because of this damage to the vessels, uh, you get something called microaneurysms. And these are actually, the, you can see them on a fundoscope. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. You also get basement membrane dysfunction. And so when you have basement membrane dysfunction, you have the leakage of lipids and proteins. And so when you have leakage of lip lipids and proteins, this will show up as hard exudates. Uh, and, and that tends to be these yellow types of uh, exudates that you'll see. And by the way, these things that I'm writing in green, these are all the findings that you'll see on fundoscope. So uh, I'm going to kind of write down all the fundoscopic findings, and then we'll go to uh, uh, an actual fundoscope, and then uh, and we'll take a look at that. Uh, Next, you're going to, so for example, with the bone marrow, sorry, not the bone marrow, the, the basement membrane dysfunction, uh, you're also going to get intraretinal hemorrhages. So within the retina, you start getting these little hemorrhages. And of course, this is going to show as a generalized hemorrhage uh, within the retina. Uh, and you'll see that on fundoscope in a little bit. Um, finally, you do get nerve fiber infarcts. And these nerve fiber infarcts will show as areas of kind of like lighter areas. And these lighter areas are known as cotton wool spots. So again, these are all of the findings that you expect to find in fundoscope. So let's look at an actual uh, fundoscopic drawing. So uh, here, let's kind of look at, kind of get us oriented. So right here, this is the optic nerve that you that you see there. And then here we have the macula. So this is the macula, or known as the fovea um, as well. Okay, so now um, the first thing that I want to show you is here, right at the uh, upper place here, that's a hemorrhage. This is an area of hemorrhage, and of course these are, and you can see the, these hemorrhages are kind of isolated right next to the uh, vessels, and these are called uh, uh, spots, um, blot, blot hemorrhages, sorry, these are called blot hemorrhages. This is going to be more of a later finding. But right now these hemorrhages tend to be around the vessel, uh, and again that's because the vessel is leaking and uh, the, the blood. Okay, you also get, if you see this uh, dilation here, this is known as a microaneurysm. Uh, so you have that dilation, and we also have these little dilations in, uh, in this area over here. Um, now these yellow things here, this is called the hard exudate. So this is lipids and proteins that have uh, escaped from the vessel due to uh, the, the basement membrane kind of weakening. And then you can see here the uh, cotton wool spot. So this is due to uh, low blood flow leading to kind of the nerve, nerve fiber infarcts. Now, if you notice this area here, you got these vessels, they're very tortuous. Um, this is the neovascularization. So this neovascularization is not part of the non-proliferative. So as soon as you see this, this is then becomes late stage or proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So th this, this, um, these uh, findings of vessels here is very, very crucial. So if you see this, you're no longer looking at early stage, you're looking at a later stage. So let's go ahead and talk about the late stage, uh, which is known as uh, proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Now, to proliferative diabetic retinopathy, uh, it may or may not develop from uh, non-proliferative. So sometimes it develops, it's, it's, it's uh, non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy happens first, and then it develops into, uh, into proliferative, and sometimes it doesn't. You just go straight to proliferative. So uh, you, you kind of need to be aware of that. In, in, and in this case here, you can see that the non-proliferative changes are superimposed on the proliferative changes. So that will kind of suggest more that it was kind of the non-proliferative changes occurred first, and then you got the proliferative changes occurred later. So what, what's going on in proliferative uh, diabetic retinopathy? Well, again, uh, you're, you're eventually getting ischemia. Um, and so because these tissues are becoming ischemic, they're releasing these growth factors, particularly VEGF, and this is leading to your neovascularization, which is those tortuous type of... Uh, 
vessels that we saw earlier, and they're very thin and narrow. Uh, but then when you have these new vessels, they'll tend to rupture. And when they rupture, they, they have different types of hemorrhages. They can either give you a flame-shaped hemorrhage, um, or you can get these types of like pinpoint hemorrhages. Uh, these are known as blot hemorrhages. And finally, if it's if it's very severe, you can get something known as a vitreous hemorrhage. So just hemorrhaging into the actual vitreous fluid. And so here's a little diagram here. So here we have a uh, flame-shaped hemorrhage. So if you, you notice, it looks kind of like a little flame. So th that's why it's known as flame-shaped. So it's kind of have that flame shape. That's what it's known as. And then here we have some three little type of pinpoint. Those are known as uh, blot hemorrhages. And so, uh, and one thing here that I kind of didn't mention here, uh, you see those vessels there? Uh, these are very torturous vessels. And this is, again, another sign of um, proliferative that you have torturous vessels. Now, if you see here, uh, what if you see this new kind of picture that I put up, this whole area here, uh, this, is an, this is a vitreous hemorrhage. So basically what's going on is the blood is leaking into the vitreous and it's causing uh, blood all throughout uh, the retina there. So, um, so this isn't within the retina anymore. This is actually going into the actual vitreous area. Uh, finally, um, you can also get fibrosis. And with fibrosis, uh, this can lead to what's known as tractional retinal detachment. So the retina actually detaches uh, completely. And so this, of course, if you have the retina detaches, this is going to lead to permanent uh, vision loss. And what's also interesting to point out is when you have the, um, uh, when you have this vitreous hemorrhage here that I mentioned, this leads to temporary uh, vision loss. And the reason why it leads to temporary vision loss, because um, initially this vitreous fluid can block the, you know, the fovea here that you can't see here, but eventually this, all this blood will get reabsorbed and after it gets reabsorbed, the vision will return. So, so remember vitreous hemorrhage leads to temporary vision loss, whereas retinal detachment leads to permanent vision loss. And again, you also have, uh, you can also produce macular edema. So again, we talk about edema uh, a lot. So you do, you do tend to get edema and this can happen at any stage. So this can happen at the proliferative stage or non-proliferative stage. And this will also be one of the causes of vision loss because of course uh, the, the macula is very important. Uh, for your vision. Okay, so um, that's kind of pathophysiology. Let's talk about the clinical aspect. So um, when we're looking at the one thing that's important to remember with uh, diabetic retinopathy, it's going to be um, relatively asymptomatic. So patients won't see any symptoms until it reaches a late stage of like vision loss or some type of uh, visual symptoms. Again, asymptomatic until a very late stage. And when symptoms develop, uh, you know, you can't really uh, pin it down as a one particular symptom. The symptoms vary depending on what's the underlying pathology. So they can see like this type of curtain. If it's due to the macula, they can see floaters, or they can even just have, you know, a decrease in vision. And that's why, because it's relatively asymptomatic, that's why it's important that uh, patients who do have diabetes uh, do have a regular screening for, for uh, the, the, the uh, fundus. And d depending on whether you have diabetes 1 or diabetes 2, uh, you're going to want to uh, screen differently. So in diabetes 1, you're going to want to screen five years after diagnosis. And then and then once you've uh, screened and it's okay, then you can continue to do it every two years. And then, of course, if it's if they see some problems, then you have to uh, see them more frequently. But if, if everything okay, looks normal, you do it every two years after that. And then in diabetes types 2, uh, sometimes, again, with in patients with diabetes type 2, by the time they get diagnosed, they may have had diabetes for many, many years. So you want to screen at diagnosis, and then again, every two years, uh, just like in diabetes type 1. And again, this will become more frequent if you start seeing changes uh, uh, on uh, fund fundoscope. So um, in diabetes type 1, almost all patients by 50 to 20 years start having some sort form of changes in the retina. So it's, it's almost ubiquitous. But with diabetes types 2, um, you know, anywhere between 50 to 80 percent will start to have changes um, by 20 years. So diabetes types 1 tends to be more severe when it comes to these uh, the retinopathy. Now, there are some risk factors that can uh, worsen uh, the retinopathy. This can be, of course, diabetes type type 1 and the duration so the longer someone's had diabetes the more the, the more likely they'll get the retinopathy uh, glycemic control so good glycemic control can decrease your risk uh, hypertension smoking can also cause it 
uh, dyslipidemia is a risk known risk factor. Um, diabetic nephropathy is important. Um, oftentimes, uh, if patient has nephropathy, retinopathy precedes nephropathy. So if they have had nephropathy, you definitely want to look at the eye because that's probably occurred first. And then pregnancy as well. And of course, uh, the reason for pregnancy is because during pregnancy, there's uh, less glucose tolerance. And so you, they tend to become more hyperglycemic anyway. So uh, how would you manage a patient with diabetic retinopathy? So as, as just like most of the complications of diabetes, uh, the first step is good glycemic control. So generally you want to keep the HbA1c to be less than 7% uh, with a few exceptions. Um, in non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, there's no real treatment that's available unless it's pretty severe, but in general, uh, non-proliferative, you just start monitoring the patient, get better glycemic control, and then uh, you know just monitor to see when it becomes proliferative. Uh, when it becomes proliferative, uh, what you can do is you can do, uh, you can give them pat retinal photocoagulation. Uh, which is a little laser that shoots into the eye and it, it kind of prevents uh, uh, the uh, retina from coming off leading to that traction that we talked about earlier. Um, and also you want to give the uh, anti-VEGF uh, uh, known as ramabizuvaf. And then again, why do you want to give this? Uh, because you want to stop producing those new vessels so they stop uh, leading to those hemorrhages and, 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 and all those issues. So here um, I, I have a picture of a patient who underwent laser photocoagulation, um, and and you can see these uh, little spots here, um, you know, and and what basically what is photocoagulation? You you put a wavelength in through the eye, it goes through in, through the whole eye, and then it eventually gets absorbed by the retinal pigment epithelium. And so, uh, if you remember what that is, it's kind of like this dark black layer that's behind the eye. And so then uh, that absorbs it, and it kind of heats it up, and it sticks the retina to the back of the eye. Uh, and so, and you can see that you just kind of carpet you know you just kind of carpet bomb i guess you can say uh all the way through here so these little spots that we've, i've kind of drawn in there um and this is uh very effective um it helps decrease severe vision loss uh, within six years by up to 50 percent. so this has been shown to be very effective um now if they do end up getting a uh, vitreous hemorrhage or they get that retinal detachment um, then what you can do is you can do what's known as a vitrectomy. And so in a, in a vitrectomy, uh, you just remove the whole vitreous humor. And so when you remove the vitreous humor, that tends to help out a lot. And you still give the anti-VEGF even if you do a vitrectomy afterwards. Um, finally, uh, what if the patient gets macular edema? Again, macular edema can happen in proliferative and non-proliferative. So any one of these. So uh, of course, you're not treating non-proliferative. But if they get macular edema with non-proliferative, you go ahead and treat it. And the treat treatment, again, is going to be intra uh, vitreal anti uh, VEGF, where they actually inject it into the eye, and then laser photocoagulation, which I mentioned over there. So um, this is a kind of an overview of diabetic retinopathy. Hope you guys learned a lot. Um, see you in my future videos. See you later. Bye.